Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois. I'm Joe Crane, the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement. We invite you to another Facebook Live event. This time around, it's part of our Illinois History Forum series. Today, we're going to take a look at Civil War letters as Illinois soldiers write home in their own letters, in their own words. We'll learn more about the book, how it came about, and of course, meet the author here in just a moment. But uh, before we get underway, I remind you that if you have a question throughout the discussion, please post in the comments section below. And even if you don't have a question, be sure to let us know in the comments where you're watching from around the state, across the country, even around the world, because we like to keep tabs of where everybody's checking in from. So we hope to hear from you soon right here on Facebook. And to get the program started, we welcome our oral history program director, Dr. Mark Tip Pew. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon, and thank you for that introduction, Joe. Uh, today I have the pleasure to uh, talk to a, a good friend of mine. You and I have known each other for quite a few years here, Mark, and uh, been colleagues. I like to think that we've collaborated on successfully on several different things. Um, you're an anthropologist by training. You got your degree in anthropology, and then you ended up in state government. I know you had 30 years with the Illinois Department of Health, and you finished off that time as the chief, the Illinois Center of Health Statistics. Boy, if there's ever some places, the, you know, the focus of what's going on right now in the world, that would be it. Uh, a, something of a demographer and a statistician. See, I can even say that term. But also, I know you got into poetry a little bit later in life, and I think that has something to do with this book. So where I want to start is just ask you how it is that you came to write this book. Yeah, well, thank you for that introduction, Mark. Um, the idea for the book was actually uh, a poetry project. I, I was inspired also by you with your series of lectures at the time of the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. And I wanted to write some commemorative poetry that if soldiers of the day were reading it, that they would feel comfortable and it would be something that they could relate to. So I started um, doing some research on that and I thought I could find a book or two that would have that sort of information in there, especially for Illinois, but I would have taken the Midwest, um, but I couldn't really find such a book. So I thought, Ugh, I'm gonna have to do this the hard way. So I came over here to the Presidential Library, actually just a couple doors down here on the second floor of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library to look at manuscripts and personal letters. And I went through the card catalog and picked out as many Illinois soldiers as I could find and just started. And then uh, after a couple years, three years, I had enough for the poetry project, wrote various poems. Um, I gave a presentation on those at the Vachel Lindsay home, at Poets uh, in the Parlor uh, series. And then they actually uh, ended up downstairs in the atrium for several months, um, hung up as a two poster boards. Uh, I think that was 2015, so that would have been the last year of the sesquicentennial. Uh, but at that point, I, I had read so many letters, and I could not find that book at the beginning that I'd been looking for, I thought, maybe there's a need there. Maybe I should start working on that. And so I read more and then finally put in a book proposal and finally got the book. And spent how long diving into these letters? Uh, I don't know. I've, I've read at least a few thousand. I don't know how many hours. I started in 2013 reading and uh, for the book, I was probably reading up to 2018, 2019. I am still coming across other collections that I'm interested in and, and, and still reading. One of the things that really struck me about how you developed this book is the organization of it. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided to organize these letters? Well, the truth of the matter is the content was determined by the soldiers and not so much by me. So when I started the reading process, I remember, I think it was Debbie Ham, who was in manuscripts, and she brought me the first collection, and she said to me, so what are you looking for in the collections? And I 
This is going to sound like a flippant answer, but it was the truth. I said, well, I don't really know what I'm looking for, nor do I know that I'll recognize it when I see it. But I, you know, I just started writing down things. And as I kept going through letters after letters, things started to coalesce. There were certain topics that they, they wrote about. And some of those turned into sections. Uh, and then those sections turned into chapters. And so there's these, the chapters are thematic. But it was the soldiers that basically told me what the, the content was going to be. And so I just chose what I thought were good examples of various things, whether that be them doing duty, um, sickness, and trying to maintain health, um, whether that was combat, whether that was trying to manage affairs from afar, you know, home life, that kind of thing. Um, they, all, they all coalesced that way. Well, when we started talking about how we wanted to do this, you were gracious enough to say, well, why don't you pick some things that really move you? Oh, yeah, you? sure. Oh, yeah. So a lot of the things that we're gonna, I'm going to be asking you about is okay. the things that really, that I found compelling when I went through here. And the first one, if we can go to the next slide here, uh, this is Private Thomas Secord. Do you want to just say one or two words about him? And here's the cover of the book, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Thomas Secord, uh, he, was, um, he was active uh, in the, some of the Mississippi campaigns and, and so on. Um, he started his uh, writing his letters actually from, um, I, I, I don't remember if he, he was one of the people at Camp Butler, but he definitely wrote letters home um, to his spouse from um, Camp Defiance, and which is where um, Caro is. And I know one of the invaluable parts of your book is that as an appendix, you've got a little short narrative about all these people that you're highlighting in their letters. Yes, there's a, so there's 165 different people wow. that I took from, and so I have a, a short um, biography for each one of those. Well, why did I find Thomas Secord so compelling? This is the text. But if we can get the, the zoom in on that text, and you can read it. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult, but here's part of the text that I really found moving. I will write as often as you will. Your letters are worth more to me than gold. And I thought that kind of summed up the whole project. Yeah, it, it very much does. And let me give you sort of a very similar but counter um, Quotation, which is actually on the next page of the book, and this is someone writing in May 1865, and he's, he writes, I often noticed my companions how tired and fatigued they would look after a long day march. Some of them would almost seem as though life itself was a burden to them, but oh, what a change has come over their countenance, a change from sorrow to joy. What has caused it? Has there been a great victory? Or has peace been declared? No. The mail has come into camp, and they have received letters from their loved ones at home. Yes, that accounts for it. For the time being, all their hardships and suffering are forgotten, all through the medicine of a letter. You know, you're reading that quote, it reminds me, as the oral historian, I've, I've interviewed hundreds of veterans, obviously not from the Civil War, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, war and terror. And that's a constant theme, that communication from home, whether it's letters or phone calls or emails and texts today, it is so important to these soldiers. Back then, letters for them were the next best thing to being there. I mean, today, maybe it's Zoom or Facebook Live. But <laughs> uh, back then, it was definitely letters. Well, on this next slide, I want to go to one of the biggest challenges you had to face because the educational level of the soldiers at that time and their writing skills wasn't quite up to what we would expect today. And so the question is, how did you sort through all of this and figure out what they were actually trying to say? So when I went to, to start looking at these letter collections, I, in the back of my mind, I was hoping that there would be transcriptions so I could just follow the transcriptions. Uh, but no, those were very rare. And in retrospect, I learned not to trust any previous transcriptions by others. 
I got very adept at reading them and finding mistakes and so on. So I realized, you know what, if you want it done right, you got to do it yourself. Well, also on day one, if you can't read cursive writing, game over. You have to be able to read cursive writing. And you there mean was different. You should be teaching cursive writing at school today? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying maybe if you're going to go into history and you're going to be reading old documents or, or letters, even if it's just from World War II or the Korean War, you're going to need to be able to read cursive writing. Um, but I also found that there was not much in the way of punctuation. So on this slide, you've circled the only three places where there's even any kind of punctuation on the letter. And there are some, pe some people that wrote during the time that used you know, the punctuation pretty much the way we did. But that was almost the exception rather than the rule. And I've come to learn that part of the reason for this is, is because they are writing many times as if they are speaking to someone. So if you are speaking to someone, you do not say, um, I am fine, period. How are you, question mark? No, you leave that punctuation off. Plus, they are also writing to loved ones, uh, other family members, relatives, close friends, who know what their voice sounds like, what their inflections are, what their accent is like, and so on. So punctuation is almost superfluous in, in that regard. So you have to kind of mentally kind of get into their head as you read various soldiers' letters on how you almost get a sense for how they spoke sometimes. Do you have a sense of the educational level that most of these soldiers had? I don't know about educational level, but um, so in the 1870, National Decennial Census was the first time they asked about literacy. And so for Illinois, uh, it was uh, just about 90%. So if you want to backtrack to you know five or 10 years earlier, it's got to be at least 80 or 85% were literate. But as you find out, as you read the letters, you find that there is a gamut of literacy that is, some people write phonetically. You know, and soldiers is spelled S-O-L-G-E-R-S instead of their correct spelling. So you, you, kind, of, you kind of get into that, and you, you're able to sort of figure out their words. And in the book, I have not made it into good English. So if they have misspellings and lack of punctuation, that is in there. Now, when I feel like it gets too difficult, in brackets, I'll, I'll put in a little bit of help on what I think that word is that you, you might not quite recognize. But that is part of the reading experience, although I, in the book I save you having to read cursive writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that strikes me about this time period, we can be critical about how poorly they spelled or the lack of punctuation and things like that. The United States, in my understanding, is far exceeded any other country in the world at this time for literacy. That could be true. That could be true. Um, and I, you know, I think most of them did. And I think those that could not write, they had fellow soldiers in their tent or their company who could write for them. They still wanted to communicate with home. And as a matter of fact, soldiers that were wounded and for some reason couldn't, they could get people from the Sanitary Commission uh, or other people that would write letters for okay, them home. Interesting. Yeah. There's one chapter called A Lifeline of Letters. It's the first chapter. And that's what these letters were for them. Not only did they want to write letters, but they were desperate, as we just read before, to receive them as well. Yeah. Well, let's go to this next slide. And it's really the first lengthy quote. I'm calling this Seeing the Elephant, which you know, and most people who are Civil War historians and know about the Civil War, that means you've seen combat. Tell us a little bit about Captain David Norton. Yes, yes. Captain Norton is writing to Mary Chapman. This is an interesting story because they had not met. And Captain Norton, from a uh, fellow officer, got a dare. I dare you to write to this lady named Mary Chapman, whom he called Molly, um, back home. 
And so Captain Norton sort of used that slim introduction to write an initial letter to her to try and get a correspondence going. And as you go through the correspondence, which is an another collection here in the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, uh, you, s you can tell they're sort of building up this intimacy. They exchange pictures. They talk about a little bit what life at home might be if they got together, and so on and so on. So he is making a mighty effort to impress her through his letters. And when we were talking about this, Mark, the thing that impressed me was we've got this excerpt from this letter that, as you said, goes on and on and on. Yeah, this is a lengthy letter, so you can tell he's really trying to make a good impression. But he was an officer who was an aide to a general. And so he had um, ends and perspectives that a lot of other soldiers on the ground might not have had of this particular engagement here at Missionary Ridge, which was part of the Chattanooga campaign. Yeah, and the reason, one of the reasons that I found so compelling about this particular excerpt, because it was about Missionary Ridge, is, which is my absolute favorite moment of the Civil War. Okay. And I think as you listen to this clip, you'll understand why. So if you could play that, please. Orders were given for our lines to move up nearer to the rebels and for our skirmishers to drive the rebels into their long lines of entrenchments at the foot of Missionary Ridge. It was gallantly done, and General Baird's division of 14th Corps, ours, was ordered to assault the enemy's works to create a diversion in favor of Hooker, who could be heard opening his part of the game. Gallantly, those noble men charged across the open field which separated them from the enemy amidst a perfect storm of shots and shells. They have taken the entrenchments. Here they are ordered to stop. But no, the balls are flying too thick. They could not stop and live. And absolutely without orders, they charged on up the hill. A thrill of anguish passed through every frame. They are lost, cries General Grant. Send the whole corps after them. But long before the order could be carried to the anxious troops, a shout that shook the earth went up from those devoted comrades, and forward they rushed upon what seemed to be inevitable destruction. Onward and upward sped those intrepid soldiers. Backward fly the astonished and frightened rebels. Oh, how beautiful those starry flags looked as they fluttered up that steep mountainside covered with bristling bayonets and cannon. Do they pause to await the arrival of their slower comrades? No. Every man pushes forward into the very mouths of the fierce cannon and with a cheer, slay, or capture or drive away the rebel artillerists. The enemy, completely dumbfoundered, fly, and our victorious boys start down the hill after them. The victory, the most glorious of the war, is ours. And I would kind of agree with them, maybe the most glorious. It was extremely rare that you had an assault like this against an entrenched enemy on the top of a hill, and that was successful. Now, I need to add a counterpoint here. This kind of description of combat or major battle is extremely rare, and that is one of the reasons why I happen to include this. More often when a soldier was in a battle and they wrote home about it, unless it was the first battle when it was kind of a novelty to them and they might describe different things that happened so their parents or their spouse knows a little bit of what's going on, their description of a battle will be, for example, if we'll take Missionary Ridge, uh, we fought a great battle at Missionary Ridge, um, I'm okay or not okay, um, so-and-so that you know is doing fine or was wounded, um, but you can read all about the particulars in the newspapers because they'll probably know more about it than I do. And that's it. So that was, again, part of that lifeline kind of thing. Hey, I know you read about the battle and you know that our regiment was there. I'm okay, I'm okay. That was what they wanted to convey, not this, uh, uh, some sort of description of what the combat well, was like. You mentioned that this uh, captain was on a general staff. Well, the average soldier's experience and his perspective is maybe the 10 or 20 guys he can see around him. Yeah, that's true. Well, this next one, I don't know if you want to m mention anything about Second Lieutenant Z. Payson Shumway before I actually read this one to the, to the audience. 
No, uh, just uh, go okay. ahead. I'm getting, and I will tell you this, that I, this is written from a camp in near Jackson, Mississippi. Yes. In July 19th, 1863. And the significant part of that is this would have been right after the surrender of Vicksburg. That's correct. In Mississippi. That's correct. So there they are sitting around the, the campsite. Just after dark, one of our boys sat down to a piano and sang and played Home Sweet Home. Of course, that old tune soon brought those of the boys who were not on post together. Before the song was half through, I could see by the light of the burning town and cotton that the silent tears stood in many an eye, which of late had been all unused to weep. Yeah, so a very poignant moment. And it reminds me of Christian McWhorter's book, Battle Hymns and the Power of Civil War Music. Here is somebody playing on a piano for some bizarre reason is in the entrenchments or on the rampart somewhere and they're, they're playing it. Well, it turns out that prior to the Union capturing that, that there was somebody named Private Douglas Carter of Texas who played on that same piano before it was captured during the siege. And that same piano still exists. He was able to get that, that is uh, this private Douglas Carter of Texas. And uh, the piano resides uh, in the Confederate Memorial Hall Museum in New Orleans. Ah. So you can still see it. So there's, uh, and when I, when I found this on somebody's website, they didn't know the Union side of it. They knew about the Confederate part. So I was able to make this connection on what Shumway wrote about. And your comments here just illustrated another thing I think was so successful in how you put this book together. The narration that you use to tie all of these things together and to give the background and the context, I think is invaluable in helping people really enjoy this that much more. So kudos in that respect. Well, thank you. But that's the, the job of, of any editor, really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and let's go to the next slide if we can. And I'm going to read a quote from a letter written by Private Victor Gould to the parents of Private George Clark. And this one really struck me. M. George, your son fell mortally wounded. He was struck with a shell tearing his body most desperately and also tearing both legs almost entirely off. He lived one hour and then quietly fell asleep, leaving many true and loving and I trust Christian friends to mourn his loss. Tell my parents, said he, that I die a brave man and in defense of my country. Wow. But the thing that surprises me, Mark, on this, yeah. he wrote the parents about the gory, gory details of his death. My experience in general, whether it is about death or specific details about the wounded or horrible circumstances, I was often surprised what they would write to their mom or their sister or their spouse or significant other that um, I, it might almost seem inappropriate. But again, as I had said, they had, as the soldiers, a need to express themselves, to get this sort of out and to uh, people back home, um, what was going on, but for them as a kind of release of what's going on. But there's another thing going on here. So, and this is covered in a book by um, Drew Gilpin Faust called This Republic of Suffering. And she talks about at that time, um, what they called the good death. That is being surrounded by family and friends as you know, you're on your deathbed and you, know, you have your affairs in order, you're wishing people well and you know, those kinds of things. Well, a civil war and battlefields totally mess that up, totally complicated and so on. But for loved ones or parents to find out the circumstances of their sons or brothers or um, husband's death, was of a comfort to them, even if there were gory details that were being described to them. That was part of 
knowing how it occurred. And that is as close as they could get to being with them or experiencing that at that moment. Mm. Amazing. Well, the next one that I selected was Sergeant William Smith to his wife. Oh. And I think I'll let you talk a little bit more about that to set this one up. It's talking about what some call the peculiar institution, what we all know today as slavery. William Smith was not only a fairly good writer, but he was expressive and he was, seemed naturally inquisitive. Uh, so he talked to Southerners when they were in, you know, occupied territory, you know, the citizens and so on. But he, as I said, he was a keen observer. And his wife, Mary, who he called Polly, um, asked him this question about slavery. And you have to remember that the median age of Union soldiers, and probably Illinois soldiers as well, was around between 23 and 24 years of age. Median meaning that at that age, half of them are younger than that, and the other half are older than that. So that means there's a lot of teenagers and you know, people in their early 20s and so on that are soldiers, many of them who had never left their state. I was just reading a, a, a letter from someone who lived only two counties away from the Mississippi River, but had never seen the Mississippi mm -hmm. River until they went to Alton, and had never seen a steamboat before. So there's all these new experiences. So his wife is asking him about slavery. So we should hear this clip. Now to the question, how does slavery look to the naked eye? The shortest answer that I can give and express myself upon the subject is that it looks many times worse than I ever imagined. It is true that I have never saw the lash across the backs of old men and gray-headed women, but I have seen men plow, hoe, chop, and maul rails with not enough clothing on them to hide their bodies. I have saw pregnant women at the hardest work with only an excuse for a shirt and short petticoat on. I've seen dozens of men, women, and children at the different kinds of work under a white man that was almost as ignorant as the slaves he drove. I have seen one woman that has tended 18 acres of corn and suckled an infant that was born after she commenced to break the ground. I have seen a young wife, modest and nice, walking along the street, a slave woman walking close behind her, carrying the firstborn of her modest mistress. Look at their figures. It is very nearly the same. See their backs? Oh, says one, they are both alike. Look at their gait. It is nearly the same. Examine their features. Look close. They certainly resemble. Ask the young mistress where she got her slave. She tells you that she was a wedding gift from her father. The secret is out. They are half sisters. Look at them again. They favor in every feature and action. The only difference is in the color. Now we're hearing a letter written by William read by his wife and you can imagine she's reading to relatives she's going to the the local store uh, other opportunities she would share this letter with people the point that is being made here is very poignant and very well expressed uh, it, it just really sinks in what slavery can be like or what they had also called amalgamation that is um, the joining of, of two different races, which, you know, is a much different opinion than, than you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's old thinking, if you will. But it, he makes this point so well, what really goes on in a slavery state or under slavery conditions. Uh, and what is sort of interesting about this is, so there was this little uh, something at the end of the letter, it's, uh, and I have it in the book here, and it says, in the same letter, along the margin of its last page, written sideways, is a drawing of a single hand pointing to a sort of postscript. And the postscript was, Charlie, which was Smith's tentmate, says, for you to burn this without reading it. 
because it was, you know, such a topic to, to put into a letter like that, that you should just burn the letter, don't even read it. So fortunately, um, Mary ignored that mm -hmm. jest request. But it's great that, that we have it and can learn from it. Well, and that's the point of this whole book and all of these letters. We get into their hearts and souls by reading these things. You have to remember that we are essentially reading other people's mail. And there's, I have to admit, there's kind of an allure to that. But also, it was something never intended for us to read. I think if those people were still alive and they you know, found out their, you know, some of their personal letters were showing up in a book, they might be aghast at, at that. But for us as uh, historians, it, it's invaluable. Have you heard from some of the descendants of these people who are in the book? Yes, some I, some I have. And um, of course, they're not the original soldiers. They're, you know, great, great grandchildren, th those kinds of things. And they're thrilled. Yeah. I've gotten some really nice comments. People have shared portraits. Other people have seen who's in there and they say, hey, I have something about that person. So I've discovered a number of other things uh, and a lot of those things I've put up on the website. So the website becomes like, makes the book a little bit more of a living document. Well, the next thing I wanted to focus on in this next slide is a little bit about the motivations and the feelings, beliefs that the soldiers themselves had about the cause they're fighting for. Uh -huh. And so I've selected a passage that touches both on the Emancipation Proclamation, which was written after Antietam in September of 62, okay. and then was actually went into force on January 1st of 1863. And then a little bit about the upcoming election of Honest Abe, Old Abe. So we'll play this one from Captain Amos Hustetter. In answer to part of Owen's letter, in regard to the opinion of the soldiers, in regard to the Emancipation Proclamation, etc., I have this to say, that if the people of the North knew how the soldiers cursed them for allowing men to speak treason as they do now, I think they would put a stop to it. Men that came here strong Democrats are Democrats no longer. Men who came here with no intention of interfering with slavery are now abolitionists. And in regard to their opinion of the administration, if the soldiers can vote in 1864 for president of the U.S., old Abe will again be president. You may not believe what I have told you, but if you live to see 1864, you will find my words true if old Abe carries out what he has commenced. Although we are tired of war, we had rather fight for the next 10 years than compromise with treason. Strong words. Yeah, now again, I'm going to have to offer a counterpoint. This is not necessarily the majority opinion among the soldiers. And this is especially something like this, which is somewhat political, um, really reflects the diversity of Democrats and Republicans in Illinois. In fact, Illinois is in some ways at this time almost a microcosm of the entire nation on how it's divided in terms of opinion. So the opinions on the Emancipation Proclamation that you find by other soldiers varies quite a bit. Some of them think this is a terrible idea because now the South is going to fight all the harder. They are going to be so mad at us that they're really going to dig in their heels kind of thing. Um, but a lot of them do look at it first as a war measure uh, as opposed to a social measure. But they had comments about that as well. Some thought, well, this could be a good thing. Some thought, well, this is not a good thing. So we, I, and I put a lot of that diversity in here. So I wanted to sort of offer that sort of counterpoint um, just based on what you happen to pick out. If you had picked out one that said, oh, you know, this is a bad idea, I would have read one where, hey, this person thinks it's a good idea. Well, if you want a little bit more of this or a lot more of this, go visit the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum. He got Absolutely. that hallway with all these 
dissonant voices and all the different opinions, strong yes. opinions they had on this very subject. Yes. It's, yeah. That's one of my favorite parts because it really does show the angst and the difficulty that Abraham Lincoln faced when he was president of the United States. Yeah, at the beginning of the war, certainly not all the soldiers in Illinois that signed up were abolitionists. In fact, they would have been quite a minority. But some of them came to see this when it did happen, that is the Emancipation Proclamation, that it was a good thing because it would shorten the war and they would get home sooner. That was the overriding thought that would be in the back of their minds all the time. And that's why they, they kept up on politics and newspapers, because they were looking for signs and symptoms of the war starting to come to a conclusion and when will we be home? There weren't any that said this is only going to lengthen the war? Yeah, there were some that said, yes, this could potentially lengthen the war. I think most historians today would, would come down on the side of the latter. But that's a debatable point, as oftentimes historical issues are. Now, I've highlighted a lot of the things that I found really interesting. Tell me what some of your favorite letters are. Okay, so... <laughs> As a, as a social scientist, I'd have to say that my favorites were the 165 soldiers that made the cut that made it into the book. <laughs> I, some of them wrote more eloquently, expressed themselves better than others, but every one of them had something to say that contributed to the book. So I, I, it's probably not the answer you're looking for, but I really don't have any favorites. Now, it is your prerogative as a reader to have favorites on what you happen to like, and thanks for, for sharing those. Uh, but I, I'm glad to have all of them, quite frankly. As you mentioned, I gave a series of presentations on the main Civil War battles yeah. during the Sesquicentennial. Centennial. Yeah. So that was my deep dive into Civil War history. I learned so much going through that process. This exercise was quite different for you. You had to have enough knowledge about the war to put all these things in context, but it strikes me that you got to know these soldiers on a much more personal level. Was it, is that a good way of saying it? Yeah, the way that I sort of think of it is, um, you know, a lot of times when you read Civil War books that are about particular battles, campaigns and so on, uh, generals, those are great. That's a top-down approach. My approach was the opposite, was to start with the boots in the mud, the soldiers, what their stories were, and then coalesce those into those topics, those sections and, and chapters. So I was very much a bottom-up bottom approach to uh, find out what, what the Civil War was like for them. Let's see. You, you went to, you got your degree in anthology? Anthropology. Anthropology. I knew I was going to mess it up. <laughs> then you're a demographer, you're a statistician. I know you do archaeology as well. And then poetry. And yeah. then this. Yeah. Where's, where's the link with the poetry and then this, with all those other things? Uh, I've always enjoyed, <clears throat> excuse me, I've always enjoyed writing. Um, but... I'm not what I think of as a naturally gifted writer. I need a lot of practice. So poetry helped me smooth out my style. And um, writing this book, one of the preludes to the book, not only was the poetry, but as I was collecting the letters, I started to see some of these themes. So I had a selection of colleagues, friends, even people in other countries who could care less about the Civil War, each Friday I would send out a email which was a themed based, something that things that I've been reading in letters. And I was surprised at how eager people that didn't even know anything about the Civil War wanted to hear these personal stories. And so that got me practicing writing and got me to get those topics together. Then the book came together after that when I decided finally to do a book that coalesced. So I call these sort of the 46 essay period because it was 46 weeks in 
succession where I mm -hmm. sent out these email blasts to people. And then more and more people said, hey, I want to I get those too, kind of thing. And finally, I was sending it out to like 40 or 50 people. In the process of reading all these letters then, uh, did you have a sense that you could really get inside these men and what they were thinking and how they approached life and their ambitions and their struggles? You really got to know them. And that's why I felt it was so important to provide these brief bios at, at the end. And it's uh, Appendix A, and it's a big chunk of the book. I've had some readers come back to me and say, you know, I read those separately. I, I read all of them, you know, as opposed to something you could use as a reference. Oh, um, William Smith, what happened to him kind of thing? Well, yes, you can, you can find that out and easy to look, look that person up. But you so can, what did happen to some of these men? So let, let, let's, let's pick a few of them. So you started with Thomas Secord. Thomas uh, Secord ended up never seeing his wife again. He got sick in Mississippi. He ended up in a hospital. And he was, what sometimes happened to people that were in hospitals, they didn't necessarily have uh, in the field uh, nurses, and so on. So they expected people that were not so sick to sort of help out the other hospital staff with, with some of the patients. And he would go around and he would, you know, tell, you know, so-and-so died overnight or so on. And then a couple weeks later, he was one of those people and he was buried there. Um, William Smith, who I had just mentioned, who wrote so beautifully, uh, ended up dying also in Mississippi at, um, I don't want to call it the Battle of Coffeeville, it's more like a sort of a large skirmish. Um, I actually wrote a little bit about that in, um, for those of you who are Illinois State Historical Society members in Illinois Heritage in their July, August issue about. Um, How about Captain Norton? He was wooing this young lady he had never met. So Captain Norton was an aide to General Palmer. And uh, when they were in Georgia, they were taking in part of the sort of overview of where the, you know, the troops on the Union and the Confederate side were there. And um, Wiley Sword, in one of his books, I think it's called maybe Profiles in Courage, where he picks out various soldiers, Turns out Norton, I found out later, was one that, that he had picked out. And so there was a couple of Confederate sharpshooters who had snuck into range, and they were aiming to shoot Palmer. And so they fired, and they missed. But they hit Norton. Um, I think he got hit in the head, and he died within a minute or two. So he never, ever met Molly Chapman back in Illinois. I, I've got to believe that you get so involved with these people's stories that that kind of stabs you in the heart when you get a piece of news like that. Ah, there are so many stories. There are the ones that, you know, were in, there were POWs. And I have a, a different chapter on POWs because, so here's the beauty of Civil War letters. They were not censored. So that's why you get all this great information. The one exception to that is prisoner of war letters. You know, you couldn't say who you were with or so on. You could say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm feeling okay or, you know, I have a touch of pneumonia or whatever it might be, but uh, they couldn't give away much in the way of details. So they're very kind of bland. But um, for, for that chapter as an exception, I took some of the soldiers' reminiscences and what they said about being at Bell Island prisoner of war camp in Richmond or Andersonville in Georgia and some of the other ones um, to sort of flesh out the Illinois soldier experience. I think one of the most tragic events of the Civil War happened after the Civil War when all those prisoners released from Andersonville get on the steamship Sultana. Uh, Sultana. Yes. Which sinks in the middle of the Mississippi River, taking scores and not hundreds of them to their death. Yeah, hundreds of them. Yeah, the boilers blew because it was way overloaded. And uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people drowned. 
Well, there's so much to talk about in this book. It was such an excellent read. I hope that our, our, those who are watching this today or in the future will take the opportunity to buy this. But I cut just a couple more questions here. Sure. How well has the book been received? I think, I think it has been well received. So um, earlier this year, the Illinois State Historical Society um, honored the book by giving it the Russell P. Strange Memorial Book of the Year Award for 2020. And uh, because of the pandemic, I got that news uh, through snail mail. <laughs> uh, you know, a certificate came uh, in and you could have pushed me over with a feather. I was so shocked. But they had recognized it as that that's their highest uh, award for um, for publishing in, in history. Um, the book now is starting to take on a life of its own. Um, there was someone who contacted me. They said they would like to develop a curriculum from that. Somebody else, um, this is actually down at um, SIU Carbondale. It sounds like that they are interested in doing podcasts oh. of parts of the book and then uploading those. Um, that's, uh, they call themselves um, Blanket Fort Radio Theater. So that's one of those things you could put in a search engine and it'll pop up what they're currently working on. So maybe they'll be able to do this this fall in 2021. So similar to what we had in terms of uh, finding people who are willing to bring these quotes to life. Exactly. That sounds ideal for a podcast. Yeah, I, I hope they go through with it. It would be excellent. How many other books are there out there like this in other states or collections of letters that have been uh, edited in the manner that you've done it? Well, there's quite a number of collections that are one soldier. Or in some cases, what I call the double rainbow is when you have the soldier's letters and the spouses or, you know, those people at home. So you can kind of see the exchange. But in terms of collections of letters, there are some that are like just small collections, like maybe, you know, 20 soldiers because they were in a, the same regiment um, or from the same area or from a variety of areas. But the one that I found that comes the closest and was done before my book, uh, it was by uh, John Zim called This Wicked Rebellion. And it is about letters from Wisconsin, but it's all letters um, sent to editors. And so people had kept these scrapbooks of all these local Wisconsin newspapers. And so they had all these soldiers' letters. But they're not all personal letters. Sometimes there's, you know, dear editor, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes they are letters that went home and then somebody at home said, oh, let's put this in the local newspaper. So some of them are a little more guarded or maybe have an ax to grind or to bring up a point or something like that. What I used was just simply personal letters. If it was official correspondence um, or some other thing that was not personal, like diaries, for example, diaries are not necessarily conversational, and soldiers kept those for various reasons. I didn't include those. I just wanted those, those personal letters, those personal yeah. stories with those details. Well, I think so much of what you've got in the book, these are universal themes that any soldier from any northern state could relate to, and the public would be well served to read this if they want to understand Pennsylvania or Ohio or New York even. And I think now it's time to turn it over to Joe. He might have a couple comments or questions. For yes, a uh, wonderful presentation, uh, gentlemen. And uh, to Mark Floto, thank you so much as someone who was born and raised at the very southern tip of the state. Uh, thank you for correctly pronouncing my hometown, Cairo, <laughs> Illinois, correctly. So many people Absolutely. get it Cairo or Cairo or whatever. But we've had folks checking in from Arizona, Florida, Kansas, Virginia, Texas, Oregon, Nevada, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, even a viewer in Yemen around the world watching today. And we Terrific. have several questions uh, that uh, tie into the broader themes of this. William wants to know, Mark, were there any families and letters who had sons on both sides of the conflict? None that I read for this particular book, although there's certainly those sorts of circumstances. Now, I did have one or two instances where there was a father and son that went to fight in the same regiment, as if the father was going to keep an eye on the son, um, 
kind of thing so that they would experience together. I was surprised actually, even though, as I'd said earlier, the median age was around 23, 23 and a half, how many soldiers I found that were in their 40s or 50s or had been Mexican war veterans um, that still went on and went into the Civil War. And I don't mean necessarily higher officers. Um, some of these were, were privates that were in their 50s. So, no, I didn't come across those, but uh, some father-son that went together as family members, and brothers, too. Lisa wants to know, do any of the letters speak about having seen Lincoln himself or who had known him? Uh, I cannot think anybody who said that they saw Lincoln, but there is a very interesting letter where soldiers... Uh, in Springfield that were waiting for their final pay and discharge went to the Lincoln home and talked to the woman or the lady of the house, which was actually Mrs. Lucian Tilton. The Tiltons had a rental agreement with the Lincoln family to live there while um, the Lincolns were in Washington, D.C. And so you find out a little bit about the Lincoln home. Um, one thing that uh, w uh, was shared with the Lincoln Home folks here was that they mentioned that the lady of the house played the piano for them. Hmm. And they said, hmm, this is the first thing we've heard that there might have been a piano there. Now, who put it there, whether it was the Tiltons or the Lincolns, uh, that's for somebody else to figure out. If but I it's can, one of those little gems that you yeah. get from a letter. If I can add just a quick note on that. Uh, the vast majority of Illinois soldiers fought in the Western Theater. Lincoln saw an awful lot of soldiers, but it was almost entirely in the Eastern Theater of Operations. I oh, would think. very good point. Yes, that's, that's correct. A couple of questions here that tie in together. First from Brad uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland, wants to know, you touched on a little bit with one of the soldiers' letters, but what did the soldiers write about Lincoln and how his actions affected morale? All right, so there is a chapter called leaders, generals, and old Abe. So soldiers wrote a lot about those that were over them, that were in charge, and whether, you know, some of them were very happy with the decisions they were made, and some of them were, were very critical. And so there were certainly comments about old Abe. As the one that you had picked up, uh, and we had read here that, uh, you know, you know, Abe is the man for us. Um, there, there were others that were critical when things looked bad, you know, when the war was going badly, that the, uh, our leaders are, you know, they're not together. And again, what's in the back of their mind is when are we going to get home? When is this war going to be over? I, I think it is relevant to suggest, though, that the soldiers, given a chance to vote in that 1864 election, uh, most would say overwhelmingly they came down on the side of Lincoln and not McClellan, who was the Democrat. That is absolutely candidate. true. And as a footnote to that, because of the way that the Constitution in Illinois was, soldiers in the field were not one of the states, Illinois was not one of the states that could vote in the field. Though there were some that were able to get home and vote, but that was the only way they could do that. Now, we mentioned a while ago that one of our viewers this afternoon is, who chimed in from Yemen. Yes. Angela says, greetings from Germany. Hi. Uh, and follows up to Brad's question, says, brilliant question. She would like to expand that to whether there are any letters where the writer and the recipient were on different sides of the conflict. Who? not in the letters that I read. Um, I do have a few letters where... They wrote to an uncle that was like in another regiment or fellow soldiers that were perhaps in another theater of war. But no, I didn't, for this sample of 165 that I used, I didn't have an instance like that. That's, a, that's an interesting thing. Mark asked, did you see any letters from deserters on either side and their reasons for desertion? There are definitely letters where they talk about people that did desert, or sometimes it was an instance that they called French leave. And French leave means 
it's something where in France, it's where somebody leaves a party without telling the host or hostess that they're leaving kind of thing. It's sort of a slightly impolite thing. So slowly, for the soldiers, French leave was something where I'm going to leave for a little bit, and then I'm going to come back. Well, in the military's eyes, that's desertion. Um, but some went back because, um, oh, my spouse is about to deliver, or my father is dying, and they couldn't get a furlough. So they might desert for that particular reason. Sometimes they weren't caught, sometimes they got pardoned. Often soldiers saw themselves, hey, I volunteered. So all this military stuff, you know, is flexible. Well, that, you know, of course, is not true, but they tried to flex it in certain circumstances. And this, lastly, uh, nice to hear from Jenny Lee on her lunch hour, watching uh, from just, <laughs> yeah, hi, just down the uh, hall here, literally in the same building. She's <laughs> part of our conservation preservation team. They take all of those uh, old documents and other items and, and restore them. Just incredible work that they do. She wants to know, did you use letters from other institutions to draw from your book? No, I actually did not. I looked at other institutions. I looked at the Logan Museum. I looked at the, um, the library down at Carbondale, the University, Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, and a few other places. And for various reasons, I ended up not using them. Um, the, the letters that I found here covered not only the span of topics, but also the geography and uh, backgrounds and political ideology that sort of spanned the gamut. The other thing is, I'm, you know, as a former demographer, I realize I'm in the last quarter or last fifth of my life. So I got to get a move on if I'm going to get the book out <laughs> kind of thing. Um, there's much more out there, but no, I was able to do this. And because I'm an independent scholar and I don't have other funding sources to be able to travel, um, although there are more and more things that are interesting that are online, I've, I did enjoy looking at the, the real thing here. Well, that's certainly a testament to uh, folks that are doing research of any kind. Uh, chances are good if it has to do with Illinois, the Civil War, Lincoln. You can likely find it at our uh, library. Joe, there are more than a thousand Civil War era collections right here in this institution. And one last uh, thing as we have about a minute before we wrap up, uh, let everybody uh, get back to work or whatever else they're doing this afternoon. Mark uh, Floto, how can folks get a copy of uh, In Their Letters, In Their Words, Illinois Civil War Soldiers Ride Home? So at the bottom of this slide here is the book website, which is the markfloto.net. Markfloto.net sounds like it's going to be all about me. No, guess what? It was an available domain name. It's strictly about the book. If you go there, on the home page, on the right side, there are links to SIU Press. There are links to various um, reviews of the book. There uh, is all sorts of different pages, question of the week um, kind of thing, which is, again, it's a Friday thing. Every Friday, I update with, with new information. There is the addendum thing. So if you wanted to read that full description of that letter about Missionary Ridge, it is on that page, and it goes on for quite a while. Here locally in Springfield, I recommend Books on the Square because they have copies that I've already put my name to. Barnes & Noble has been known to have it, but of course there's the usual sources. You can go to, to Google or, or Amazon. Um, I do rec uh, recommend... SIU Press, they got sort of a two-for-one deal where you can get the electronic version, you know, the ebook version, and um, the, the regular book as, um, for a reduced price. It's like um, two-for-one. I didn't, I, they gave me a copy of the electronic version, and I said, yeah, thanks, I don't know what I'll do with it. I do a lot with it. Um, the book has an incredible index. I hired one of the best people possible. Uh, one of the readers, uh, Glenna Schroeder-Line, to, to do that. And she, but 
it is so great to use the electronic version to word search. So you've read something and you go, hey, where was that thing about slavery to the naked eye? And you can just put in those words and it'll pop up in the ebook. So I found it's worth having both. Needless to say, a great Christmas gift. Yes, Christmas is coming right up. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> That's just trying to help. Just trying to help. Uh, Mark uh, DePew, as always, thank you for a wonderful job of uh, moderating the discussion. Thank you. And Mark Floto, the uh, author of and editor of, uh, uh, well, actually, the Civil War uh, soldiers wrote the letters, but you edited it all together, put it into context. In their letters, in their words, Illinois Civil War soldiers write home. Thank you for the presentation today. A wonderful discussion. My pleasure. Hi, everybody out there in Facebook land. <laughs> well, thanks all for watching and hope you can join us soon live from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois. Have a wonderful afternoon.